Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, before I begin today, I think I first must briefly address the April Fool's video I did recently. So, that was an April Fool's video. I know I didn't say so in the video, but rest assured, everything I said in that video was bullshit because April Fool's is the one day of the year where it is okay to lie. But nevertheless, I think that joke may have went a little bit too far. So, if anybody panicked, I am sorry about that. But anyways... So recently, a new study was released from Good Korea claiming that dutasteride use can cause chronic infertility issues. Disappointingly, but not surprisingly, the hair loss community is in full-blown meltdown mode right now. Without taking any time to actually critically analyze any of the details of this study, there are already dutasteride users proclaiming that all is lost and that they're too scared to use dutasteride now because they don't want to have to choose between their hair and having kits. Dutasteride users, it's time for you all to take a deep breath and calm the fuck down. You are called the dutasteride master race, not the dutasteride cuckold race. I'm a finasteride peasant, so as someone who is beneath you, I shouldn't have to remind you to show a little mental fortitude and and backbone and take a little time to actually apply some critical thinking skills before doomsaying all of the internet. All you're doing by doing that is scaring other people away from legitimate treatments. So please, Jones, relax. Just because the title and abstract of a study doesn't tell you what you want to hear does not mean it's worth drawing any strong conclusions from. There have been plenty of deeply flawed, fear-mongering research hit pieces done on five-eared hippers before. Believe me, I know I've covered just about all of them, and this one is no exception. I am telling you now, there is nothing to worry about. So before the Dutasteride master race decides to start swapping out their Dutasteride for Valium and downing it with vodka, let me break down the research and explain why this study is nothing to worry about. So here's the study. It's titled, quote, Long-term use of Dutasteride to treat androgenic alopecia in young men may lead to persistent abnormalities in semen parameters, unquote. So even though this study is from Good Korea, which is usually a good sign, which, since that's where a lot of excellent hair loss research has been done, this particular study is dishonest right from the start. It describes the study as a randomized controlled study. That's odd, though, because the groups in the study were not randomized, and there's no control group in the study at at all. The study was based on men who had gone to a fertility clinic in Good Korea because they were having fertility problems, obviously. Fertility problems are common, and hair loss is common too, so some men seen at a fertility clinic will also be on hair loss drugs like finasteride or dutasteride. And in the case of dutasteride, the drug is very commonly used as a hair loss drug in Good Korea, since unlike in the United States, dutasteride actually is approved to treat androgenic alopecia in Good Korea, which is something the authors of the study point out. So, if you have a fertility clinic in Good Korea that has thousands of patients, then of course some of them are bound to be taking dutasteride, but that doesn't mean that dutasteride had anything to do with their infertility. Of course, we could tell if the dutasteride played a role in their infertility if the investigators had measured their semen parameters before dutasteride was started and then measured them again on dutasteride, but that didn't happen because this is a dishonest study. If you only read the abstract of the study, which I imagine is the farthest most people who are freaking out about the study got, then you would think that the investigators did measure baseline semen parameters and then randomized the men to take either dutasteride or a placebo control, after which they repeated the semen parameters. That would be my idea of a good randomized controlled study, but that is not what was done in this study at all. Instead, these investigators found 314 men who visited their fertility clinic between the years 2021 and 2023 who just so happen to be on dutasteride. After they threw out 114 men for various reasons, they ended up with 200 men who were infertile and were taking dutasteride. They then divided these 200 men up depending on how long they had been on dutasteride and somehow ended up with five groups of exactly 40 subjects each that were on dutasteride for less than six months, between six and 12 months, between 13 and 18 months, between 19 and 24 months, and more than 24 months. So again, this was not a prospective trial where they started men on dutasteride and kept them on it for different lengths of times. That would have been a good study design, but that's not what was done here. We know that what this actually is, is a retrospective trial, because the men were seen in the fertility clinic before 2023, and the study was only approved to be done by the Ethics Committee in 2024. So it had to have started after the patients were already seen in the clinic. So these men were put into groups based on how long they had been on dutasteride, yet somehow the groups turned out to have exactly 40 men each, which is quite a coincidence. 
That means there were exactly the same number of men who showed up to the clinic who were taking Dutasteride for less than six months as there were men taking it for over 24 months in every division of time in between. Sorry, Chooms, but that's just way too coincidental, which brings up the question as to how the men in these groups were really selected. Were there actually more than 40 men who were taking Dutasteride for each time period, and were the extra cases excluded from the study to even out the numbers? And if anyone was excluded, would that have affected the results? There's no way to tell because the investigators claimed there were only 200 subjects who qualified for the study, and somehow, when they were divided up on the basis of how long they were on Dutasteride, the groups all contained exactly 40 men each. So first of all, the study was written up in a very misleading way, claiming to be a randomized controlled study when it's obviously not. We see that by definition, all these subjects had fertility problems to begin with, since all of them had gone to a fertility clinic to have a workup for fertility. Of course, people in a fertility clinic are going to have more abnormalities when their semen is analyzed than just random people off the street. Finally, it looks like the subjects were selected in some way to result in an exactly even distribution of how long the men had been on Dutasteride, which seems like way too much of a coincidence to believe. Anyways, what the study actually did was take a semen sample in all the men on Dutasteride and then have all of them stop Dutasteride for six months. After that, they repeated the semen sample and compared it to the first sample. So, Looking at the results, the average age was 34.3 years, and there was no significant difference in age between the groups. Everyone in the study was on Dutasteride for treating androgenic alopecia. So, let's first look at the difference between the groups before Dutasteride was stopped. First of all, if you look at the semen parameters that were measured, they all look like they got worse the longer men were on Dutasteride, though not all the changes were statistically significant. The authors state that there were no significant differences between the study groups in sperm concentration, normal sperm morphology, and sperm vitality, though it is interesting that the p-value for sperm vitality is less than 0.05, which would mean a statistically significant difference, though the investigators don't mention this for some reason. But maybe this is just a typo in the table, because there are other typos in this table as well, like right here where they state that 100% of subjects had androgenic alopecia, but then write that there were only 25 subjects in each group when they mean 40 subjects. So you can see right here all the low p-values are tagged with the letter B, which means a p-value less than 0.05, except the p-value of 0.031, which is also clearly less than 0.05. So is the p-value not really 0.031, or was it really 0.031, and the investigators didn't notice that 0.031 is less than 0.05 and so was statistically significant. These type of errors don't exactly inspire much confidence in the other numbers in the study. And keep in mind, Chums, this isn't a problem with the translation from the Korean language into the English language. These are numbers, and numbers are the universal language. This is just sloppy work we're talking about here, Chums. Anyways, the study found that semen volume and sperm motility were significantly reduced as the duration of dutasteride treatment increased. Also, there was a greater increase in the fragmentation rate of DNA with a greater duration of dutasteride treatment. So we'll go ahead and get back and analyze these initial results in just a moment, but let's take a look at the other results of the study, which is what happened six months after stopping dutasteride. If you look at this figure right here, you can see that sperm concentration, semen volume, and sperm motility all improved slightly after the men were off to Tasteride for six months. However, the increase in sperm concentration was not statistically significant. Sperm motility improved off to Tasteride, though the increase was not significant in all the groups. There were no statistically significant improvements in the sperm vitality, DNA fragmentation, or sperm morphology off to Tasteride. There was, though, an increase in semen volume after stopping Tasteride. The investigators then analyzed the data in a different way. They compared the risk of having abnormal semen parameters in men on dutasteride longer than six months versus less than six months. They found that longer duration of dutasteride use correlated with decreases in semen volume and sperm motility. However, duration of treatment did not correlate with sperm concentration, DNA fragmentation, or sperm morphology. Finally, the investigators did a calculation that supposedly indicates that reduced semen volume becomes persistent after 17.8 months of dutasteride therapy and decreased sperm motility becomes persistent after 20.3 months of treatment. This is a pretty ludicrous statement, since even if you believe that dutasteride caused these changes, you'd have to wait more than six months to conclude that any changes were persistent given dutasteride's very long half-life, which I've discussed many times. So the study concludes by saying that dutasteride causes significant effects on certain sperm parameters parameters that could affect fertility, like semen volume, sperm motility, and DNA fragmentation, and that these parameters don't get much better if you stop dutasteride for six months. The investigators finally warned that young men planning to have children should be carefully managed when treated with dutasteride. 
So there are two main parts of this study that we need to analyze here. The first part is the claim that dutasteride causes problems with semen parameters and sperm function that could cause infertility, and that the longer you are on dutasteride, the worse the sperm function is. The second part of the study claims that sperm function improves if you go off dutasteride, but the improvement worsens the longer you are on dutasteride, and even becomes persistent if you are on dutasteride long enough. So let's examine the first claim first, that the duration of finasteride use is associated with worse semen parameters. The specific parameters parameters that were statistically different amongst the groups were semen volume, sperm motility, and DNA fragmentation. First of all, keep in mind that we are not looking in the study at individuals that had their semen checked before they started dutasteride and then every six months after starting dutasteride. That would have actually been a good study design. Instead, what we have here in this study are men who never had their semen parameters checked before starting dutasteride at all. They did not even have their semen parameters checked periodically on dutasteride. Instead, different men were put into these groups depending on how long they have been taking dutasteride. The fact that there ended up being exactly 40 men in each of these groups raises the question as to how these men were selected. Were they randomly selected from all the men taking dutasteride who were seen in the fertility clinic over the three years from the beginning of 2021 to the end of 2023? If any men were excluded, what were their semen parameter measurements? Is it possible that there was some bias in selecting the subject for this study that ended up supporting the hypothesis of the investigators that the longer you take dutasteride the worse the semen parameters are? Even if there was no bias, the fact that there was no control group makes the interpretation of this study impossible. What are the average semen parameters for men in this fertility clinic who were not taking dutasteride? Are they better than what was seen in these men taking dutasteride? Are they worse? If they are worse, you could make the argument that dutasteride actually improves the semen parameters. Again, I must stress that without a control group and without knowing the semen parameters these men had before they started dutasteride, it is impossible to interpret the differences in these groups. There's the same problem with the second part of the study. The fact that semen parameters improved with stopping dutasteride does not mean that the dutasteride caused the decreased parameters in the first place. If there was a control group of men who were not taking dutasteride or who continued dutasteride after the first visit for six months, these results would be easier to interpret. It turns out that there are some causes of infertility and sperm dysfunction that could be treated with simple measures that most fertility clinics would advise patients to take on their first visit to the clinic. Common activities can affect sperm quality, like bicycling, running, and other intense exercise. Even something as simple as wearing boxers instead of briefs can improve sperm quality, including affecting sperm motility. So after a first visit to a fertility clinic, it's likely that many patients get lifestyle advice that all by itself could improve sperm function, which would have shown up if the investigators actually had a parallel control group that was seen six months after the initial visit. If that group had been included, it would have clarified whether the improvements in semen parameters were due to stopping dutasteride or had nothing to do with stopping dutasteride. But I'm sure somebody in the comment section is writing right now, but Kevin, these men had decreased semen volume and everyone knows that finasteride and dutasteride can affect the prostate so that semen volume goes down. So that must have been from the dutasteride, right bro? So it is possible that dutasteride affected the semen volume in these men, but since low semen volume is defined as less than 1.25 milliliters, only the group that was taking dutasteride for more than 24 months actually had a low semen volume with an average volume of 1.11 milliliters. And that volume actually went to above normal after stopping dutasteride. Also, low semen volume is less of a concern for fertility if the sperm concentration is normal to begin with, and a normal sperm concentration is anything over 15 million sperm per milliliter. And actually, all the groups in the study had normal sperm concentration. Now, there were abnormalities of sperm motility and DNA fragmentation that were seen, but let's put this into perspective, Jones. These are all men being seen in a fertility clinic to evaluate their fertility levels. Would you really expect them to have normal sperm parameters? The fact that they were all also on dutasteride doesn't at all prove that their infertility was due to their use of dutasteride. The investigators assumed that the fact that the sperm parameters didn't all return to normal after after stopping dutasteride was due to their dutasteride use causing permanent side effects. But another interpretation here is that dutasteride wasn't actually the cause of their infertility at all. Also, this study doesn't tell us anything about what the chances are of becoming infertile while taking dutasteride. In order to do that, you would need a prospective study. Prospective studies of the effect of 5-air blockers on fertility do exist though. I actually cover them in this video here. For example, here is a study from 1999 of men randomized to a dose of 1mg 
milligram of finasteride per day versus a placebo. The study found a very slight, statistically insignificant decrease in semen volume with finasteride versus a placebo. There is no effect on spermatogenesis, sperm concentration, or sperm motility. Another randomized control trial was done in 2007. It's this one right here. The study looked at both finasteride at 5 mg per day and dutasteride at 0.5 mg per day versus a placebo. The study found that the total sperm count decreased slightly after 26 weeks of treatment, but then returned to normal after 52 weeks of treatment, and was normal also 24 weeks after stopping the drugs. There was also a small decrease in sperm motility between 6 and 12 percent during treatment with either drug. The investigators point out that even with the transient reductions in sperm counts, for most subjects, the sperm count still remained in the normal range, though two subjects had more marked decreases in sperm counts, one on dutasteride and one other on the placebo treatment, which again shows you why you need a placebo control group in these type of studies. The investigators felt that the small decrease in sperm motility that was seen probably had minimal clinical significance. Now on top of this, there are some case reports of men being on finasteride with low sperm counts who had improved sperm counts after stopping finasteride, like this one here. There's also this article here that surveyed men at a fertility clinic and found that only 27 of 4,400 men in the clinic were on finasteride, which is 0.6% of the cases. The men had low sperm counts that improved after stopping finasteride. The study doesn't mention any of the subjects being on dutasteride, though. Also, despite my combing of the medical literature, I could not find a single case report of dutasteride causing infertility or problems with sperm production. If dutasteride really caused infertility as often as the study from Good Korea implies, you'd think there would be a lot more case reports of dutasteride causing infertility by now. So, I think the lesson to learn from this data is that in men with pre-existing fertility problems, finasteride or dutasteride might make these problems worse. So I think if you are having problems with fertility or you want to maximize your chances at having good fertility because you want to have a baby, it's pretty reasonable to stop finasteride or dutasteride for a short period of time in order to possibly improve semen parameters. But you shouldn't panic about this study from Good Korea because it's complete bullshit. This is a very poorly designed and sloppy study and the data is completely untrustworthy. In addition, it overhypes the study design by falsely calling it a randomized control trial when it clearly is not one. I am also highly suspicious that there was selection bias in choosing the groups of the study since it's very weird that the number of subjects in each group was exactly 40. And just finding men in a fertility clinic who happen to be on dutasteride does not prove that dutasteride caused their fertility problems. So, if dutasteride does cause fertility problems, it is probably extremely rare since there aren't even any case reports of it happening at all. So to all the illustrious members of the dutasteride master race, let me assure you, you have nothing to fear. So please, live up to your title and show some damn courage. All right, Jooms, I have some more premium content coming in the near future, but thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all next time. God bless.